Today, unscrambling the macroeconomic omelette. So today, I have a special treat. I have two well-known people who are absolutely on top of their game in the studio with me. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Martin. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So do here. introduce yourselves first. I'm sure they, not people will know, but, but start yeah, with you. Yeah, sure. So yeah, Damien Klassen back again. So we, we are on the Nucleus Wealth um, Investment Funds uh, and we we're partnered with Walk the World for uh, providing super and non-super products. And David Llewellyn-Smith, uh, uh, bloggers Houses and Holes at, at Macro Business and, uh, and also function as the strategist at Nucleus Wealth and the funds. Mm. And it's interesting because, of course, there's also uh, the Water Wealth Fund that uh, Damien runs for me. So there's an interesting connectivity and synergy here. But what's interesting is we actually quite often think share some very common views about some of the issues facing the economy right at the moment. And uh, uh, perhaps not necessarily totally mainstream views, but really very important views. And I thought it might be good just to explore a few of those thematics at the moment, right, as we come in towards the end of 2021 and into 2022, because there look to me to be some choppy waters ahead. I think that's right. Um, I would say probably the views in this room are quite out of step with the mainstream at the moment, Martin. Mm. Um, in particular, you know, there's a lot of debates in the press and in the markets about the return and rise of inflation. Uh, which of course comes with the implication of rising interest rates as well and we've seen some of that in Australia recently just with markets breaking the RBA in two <laughs> over its knee uh, for fixed term rates and things. Um, uh, but our view is that, that, uh, it, that markets are pretty out of step with what's coming for the Australian economy. Like we think that uh, the supply side stuff globally will probably ease and more importantly here we've got the resumption of mass immigration and you know the fixed rate bust that we've already seen is likely to slow housing and so we think that um, Australian inflation will lag a lot and interest rates here will really struggle to rise at all. And the slowdown in Chinese housing? Oh, of course yes, mm. commodity prices um, <laughs> have already fallen a lot and will keep doing so. so. So, so it's sort of, to me, it's, it's this quandary about going, okay, um, everyone, I think politically would like things just to jump back to where they used to be and go, okay, everything's, you know, we're back to, back to where it was. Mm. And, and for us, it's, it's now trying to work out which of the elements will jump back to, to where it was. And, and so as you spoke about immigration. So, I mean, there is still a question mark, will the people come? So you can build it, but, but will they come? And probably, but, you know, we don't know for sure. That's, that's one worth watching. But... Um, at the same time, the, some of the change. So, so we do think there are some of the changes, in, especially in terms of say Chinese property, um, where it does look like they're quite serious about this. And and in terms of returning to the history, is yes, returning to the history, but it's the history that they had in say 2015, where there was quite a concerted slowdown. And and then the question about you know will we come, will they decide to reopen the debt taps and come roaring out of that again? Probably not. I mean, again, that's a, there there are some questions, but yeah. I think it's so one of my interesting observations is it seems to me that the market is reading the economy very differently from the way that we're reading it. I mean, they're saying rates are going to rise and they're going to rise quite quickly. I guess they're looking at um, you know the US and inflation and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the question is, are they really right or are they actually missing the important point, which is actually economic momentum probably is going to be really tough to drive from this point forward. The um, you know iron ore price and other um, you know the um, stuff we sell overseas not necessarily going to work as well and even locally the economy here locally is not firing that well. Look, I think I think next year's will be okay. Mm. Like there's enough sort of tail on the stimulus right from COVID and but it's it's definitely on, on a um, flight path down uh, and. And I, I would expect as the year goes on for it to get more difficult, basically. Yeah. I mean, we, we do have lots of momentum in the labour market and other things, you know, that uh, if they were left to develop, well, might actually give us back some positive inflation mm. in wages growth. Probably would, in fact. Uh, Australian unions are probably stronger still than some of the Anglo other Anglosphere countries if they were left 
to their own devices, but of course they won't be, and it won't matter who's in power either. Um, and this is where the immigration model becomes really important <laughs> yeah. because it's it's just a permanent supply shock in the labour market and it, it just kills wages growth. And it took us 10 years to beat this sense into the RBA and we finally did. And so at least now that whole debate has been taken out of the realms of culture wars and racism and all that kind of foolishness. Mm. And now it's an economic story. But it's one that the major parties in Canberra simply won't canvas uh, change to. So, you know, uh, that's a critical element in seeing Australian inflation as diverging. Um, and, you know, the housing market's actually in a bit of a shock yeah. right now from fixed rates. I mean, they were on the fixed rate mortgages from the term funding facility and yield curve control that the yeah. market's just broke. You know, they were very central to this tearaway boom we've had. So that, I think, is going to come off fast. Uh, not necessarily price falls, but I think growth is in trouble. Mm. Um, and and so uh, and then the commodity price story, as Damo says, like um, that really does look real yeah. this time. Like where China, you know, we're we're in one of those strange kind of good news is bad news stories on that front. Where if China makes an error in how they're trying to manage that adjustment, then then we might get the flood stimulus and another round of commodity price boom. Mm. But if they manage it reasonably well uh, with the various offsets and stimulus they've got to um, counteract falling growth from diminishing property, uh, then iron ore's in all sorts of pain for more or less ever yeah. from here. Uh, and not just iron ore, all the bulk commodities. And they could, they could fall a lot more even if we see, you know, some of the rising commodity prices in base metals and stuff that's attached to the environmental story, lithium and whatever, and they would completely swamp all of that anyway. And so you could still have a reasonably robust commodity outlook globally, and yet Australia's would be very poor. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, all of those kind of tip into, uh, well, the way we're seeing it, MB, is basically we're sowing the seeds of another lost decade, uh. Martin, you know, which is what we did in 2012. Uh, and it looks very, very similar, you know. So one of the things I think about is underinvestment in businesses and in, in the future, right? The, the, the capital numbers weren't great. They weren't, you know, too bad. But Look, they were pretty good, but, yeah. but the, the issue is uh, like it, it took an enormous amount of stimulus yes. to get them to be pretty good. Yes. Uh, and most of it is, isn't great CapEx anyway. Yes. Uh, you know, it's more your, your new ute and, and tools and what have you. Um, so, but if, if you, you're, you're quite right in that if you look at capital investment as a percentage of Australian GDP, it's like 60 year lows. Yeah. And what about the mix of um, bank lending to housing versus to business? Because that has completely switched over the last 20 years, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, we all know that, yeah. that story. It's... it's um, any number of different drivers to it, and there's no end in sight. Yeah. No, I mean, there's simply no will in Canberra to to shift it. And then, of course, you know, the power of the banks to lobby, et cetera. And yeah. Can I, can I add one more thing into the... the let's, say the let's say we didn't have a, everyone come back on the, on the, on the population side, like, mm. like, or, or it's below expectations, saying, OK, well, is, is there potential for some wage growth there? And, and you go, yeah, maybe if, if that happens. But it, so, so it's sort of like one side of, you know, maybe we haven't got quite enough and people are more concerned about um, lifestyle and, and may, so maybe they demand higher wage rise. Mm. So that's on one side. But the flip side, you can also have a case, and I'm not quite sure which one comes out, where um, people are actually saying, you know what, life's too short. I actually want lifestyle now. I don't care about it. And someone says, well, how about an extra five grand if you come back in the office? And they go... No, 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 no. I'll take a five grand pay cut to have, you know, another couple of days at home or, or to be able to work from Noosa or, you know, or something like that. And if that's the case, then there's actually a productivity um, loss in terms of you have to hire a few more employee, employees to do the same job. Mm. Uh, wages, while the aggregate wage bill for Australia might be going up, the individual wages for, for people aren't going up. They actually might even be falling a bit. And so maybe at, there's actually a demand drop off. 
And I'm not saying this is a base case, but I'm saying, well, that's, that's a relatively realistic scenario. And I look at a lot of, the, there's some weird surveys coming out now about, um, in particular, millennials, you know, just not getting job satisfaction. Um, and it's, this isn't a pandemic thing. This is the last six months. It's sort of the, the and so that, and that's the ones I just worry about saying, I don't actually know what that means. Does that mean we end up in this low demand, lower wages part where people just don't want to work as much and, and, and it's productivity sucking? Or does it mean that, no, you just need to wage, raise, raise wages faster and it's actually a demand boom for, for people with higher wages? Except that if you lift wages, then that's going to put pressure on prices and that's going to then potentially dampen demand and all of those things, right? Yeah. So there's some interesting feedback loops there. The other feedback loop that I'm interested in is the exchange rate, right? Because if, in fact, around the world, other central banks start to lift rates, and they probably should, and we don't, what does that do to the exchange rate? Well, it's going to fall. Mm. It's certainly central to our outlook. Yeah. Um, and that's, but there's, there's lots of different inputs into the value of a currency, but the two big ones for Australia are the interest rate spread, like yeah. the difference between our rates and elsewhere, mm. uh, and commodity prices, because they really determine national income and, uh, and, and thereby um, wages yeah. and inflation, et cetera. So the two um, interact. Um, and we obviously think the commodity story is weak and then you throw in the fact that inflation is very strong in the US uh, and some other jurisdictions, but it's largely a US story still. Uh, then you get a, a powerfully rising US dollar yes. while you have you know, a whipping boy Australian dollar. Uh, and so you, you could get some, some uh, pretty dramatic moves down in the Australian dollar, yes, if, if that plays out for sure. And would the Reserve Bank like a weaker dollar? Uh, yes, they would. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, and, and I think they'd, but probably in their, in their heart, they'd probably prefer they didn't have to blow a housing bubble to, to get there as yes. well. But, yeah. So, yeah, I think if. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and so you've just touched on the other thing, Damon, which is APRA. You know, everyone's saying, well, APRA is going to actually have to do macro prudential to try and calm the housing market. Do you think it might actually just do it on its own? <laughs> well, at the moment, we're in danger of becoming uh, pro cyclical. Yeah. Mm. Because. They've all been taken by surprise by the trashing of their yield curve control, which, <laughs> which I, I think uh, homeowners should probably be pretty annoyed about, mm. to be honest. I mean, we don't have an inflation problem. We know as sure as hell don't have any inflation in our wages. Uh, and yet the RBA has just rolled over and let the market determine short-term interest rates uh, without putting up uh, the, uh, the remotest of fights, yep. whilst it's promising homeowners to keep rates low till 2024. I mean, uh, that, that seems to me um, at, at best to have pointed out some flaws in its forward guidance policy settings that really need you know, some examination. Um, but APRA is now tightening as well yep. as this unexpected yield curve collapse has happened. Uh, and so, you know, they, they, we're, I mean, I, I actually think house prices are going to flatten out really fast. Yep. Uh, and one of the surprises next year might be APRA actually backflipping. Yep. Um, and I don't think we'll see the RBA forced to print or anything yet unless the commodity prices really crater. But I could see APRA, a circumstance where APRA actually is forced to loosen um, by the end of the year, say, because they are acting pro-cyclically, yeah. um, because they've lost control of their short-term interest rates. Um. So thinking about APRA and the Reserve Bank, right, and the dancing they've been doing, um, people have been suggesting that maybe there's a need to ask some harder questions of particularly the RBA and probably APRA too. Now, I know Phil Lowe's come back and said, well, we'll probably look at yield curve control and we might look at the term funding facility, right, which is, to my mind, a misdirection of the question that should be asked. Do we need a fundamental review of the RBA and its role and its function, do you think? Well, we absolutely do in theory. Yeah. Um, but as we discussed before on camera, like, mm. is there much point when you have a banking royal commission with the outcomes that we did? Like, yeah. These, these inquiries just sort of fall into a void. But, but yes, we do. And the structure of Australian monetary policy is completely broken. Yeah. You know, we don't know who's setting it. Um, the RBA is only half in control. APRA's half in control. Um, you know, the appointments of, of 
senior staff, I, I run through the treasurer who, you know, for instance, uh, the chairman of APRA was reappointed in the middle of the Banking Royal Commission, which was destroying his credibility as he was reappointed. And it was like, you know, where's the accountability in this system? Um, you know, there's diffused responsibility between the two in macro prudential and, and the, you know, the cost of money versus the distribution of money. And it's, it's a mess. Mm. Now, they manage it through the Council of Financial Regulators, <laughs> as we know, but that's diffused responsibility too. Yeah. So nobody's accountable for anything. Uh, and, you know, perhaps you could argue that's why we ended up with a yield curve control setting that just got smashed mm. at the first sign of trouble. Um, the, it's not robust the way it's operating. No. And and when I can't think of when we, the last time we had a, a an external appointment from you know another central bank from somewhere else around the no, world or, no, or anything no, like no, that. That's right. There was well, we've often no argued. Point. I mean, the RBNZ's made a bit of a hash of things over the last few years, but we used to argue we should get a few of those cats in <laughs> yeah. just to shake it up because they did have stronger kind of intellectual uh, credibility mm. over the last few decades. Well, well, and also the just the part, regardless of even if you are doing a good job you want people to challenge your views and if you've basically brought people yeah. up and said this is the way we teach everyone to think at, at this and then now yeah, you're yeah. the leader and it's actually saying well let's like get by, by all accounts differently. They're, they're both incredibly defensive mm -hmm. organizations like mm -hmm. intellectually closed um politicized i i guess I, I would more not necessarily politicized in the sense of national politics but uh politicized in terms of office politics yeah Right, you know, and, and they have a narrow ideology, themselves. don't they? They have Absolutely. a narrow ideology about what Look, works and what doesn't work, and what they can and what they can't do, and how they operate. Look, it, it has started to sort of loosen up a little because yeah. they spent ten years missing their target, <laughs> yeah. right? And so they eventually realised, well, maybe we're doing something wrong. Yeah. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, just about everybody I know who comes out of there, and there's a lot of people who go through these organizations and then into the private system mm. economists etc analysts they all say the same thing that that um, ideas are not at a premium in there <laughs> you know okay last question before we close there's an election coming probably sometime next year right is that going to make any difference at all uh to what <laughs> uh, not a lot no, no. I mean, not 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 a lot in terms of what we're talking about here, no. the macroeconomics yeah. of the economy. Mm -hmm. The Labor, um, Labor, Labor has a slightly more hawkish view on immigration, but it's really, we're debating visa categories rather than actually shifting it, or trying to shift it away from the impacts on the labor market that it's having. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're more or less going to be elected um, on a zero platform, yeah. like we don't really know what Labor wants to do, and that well, might be a clever political strategy. I think it is because Morrison's on the nose, so make him the issue. Uh, that might get them elected, but it gives them zero. Uh, but the Liberals don't have a policy either. Uh, well, they don't. No, so so, so inertia. Two, two parties with neither of them who are suggesting anything yeah. really except vote me in and let, let us be in charge yeah i mean I, I don't expect any, any any reform i mean we we probably will see an inquiry into the rba yeah. uh, but how high powered it is is questionable and then of course if anyone actually listens is the second question right and that's what i was going to sort of say that it seems to me that the political processes in australia are designed to not make a difference Yes. Right. We go through the motions, we go through the processes, we have the elections, yeah. you know, we have the Reserve Bank saying this and that and the other. But actually, at the end of the day, the fundamental issues that should be being tackled and addressed to build a future for Australians is not being addressed. No. Well, but we'll build a list, though. The same as well, we've had a housing inquiry. God knows how many housing inquiries. They build the list and we know what to do and we don't do any of it. We had yeah. a banking royal commission and we build a list and we don't. We say we're going to do everything. Yeah. Yes, we're going to tick them all off, but we don't. And then so is well, we have an affordability inquiry right now, yeah. don't we? Which, yeah. well, you know, which, which even even most of those who are inside the tent are pissing on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like it's, so what is it? Is this the Australian disease, or is this a broader disease? Do you think? I think you can see it at work in other jurisdictions. Yeah. I mean, places like the US have policy paralysis yeah. Yeah. similar. Uh, uh, but I, I do think perhaps, you know, that 
there are peculiarities uh, to it that are Australian. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we could go on a long time about this, <laughs> but probably the key one is is just China, the rise of China and the commodity boom um, made life really easy, and and bad policy looked like good policy. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the reverse of that is now. Uh, as things get tougher, then bad policy will look like terrible policy, which is why what's happened over the, la the last decade we've just had, uh, and why we had such churn in our prime ministers because, you know, they're they're of a culture that uh, can't cope with the need for real reform, yes. and so they fail and they're booted, fail and booted, um, and and then we end up with you know the, the likes of Scomo. So so the thing th that I'm always wrestling with is there is clearly a case for reform. There is a case to do things differently, right? Oh, yes. And yet, it just doesn't seem to translate into outcomes of elections or outcomes of policy makers or outcomes from regulators. Everybody's just dancing the old tune. So how do we get the new tune started? Uh, well, that's no Revolution. Small, that's no small Revolution. question, man. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I... It, you, you probably, it's very difficult to mobilise something in such a, a bourgeois, comfortable kind of state. Right. Um, even though we have uh, our, our inequalities and they're getting worse, yeah. etc. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure we're capable of actually changing it without some kind of external stimulus or, or shock. Okay. So we need a crisis. We probably do need a crisis. <laughs> right. Um, well, but, but we've had crises, and, and we've, what we've always done is just supported the existing system. Can I, can I point you in a, in a... in I want you to keep going. David often talks about um, things that China's doing that actually help Australia achieve the right solution without yeah. actually... So maybe, maybe I think that might be... Well, we could part. rely on Beijing to fix yeah. it for us, Martin. Right. I mean, that's what we've done most of the time. We needed to yeah. diversify our trade away from China, and, mm. and so Beijing has started doing that for us. <laughs> like, we, we haven't done a damn thing. And, and of course, we had the foreign investor um, housing bubble from sort of 2015 through 18 or 14 through 18, and, mm. and it was Beijing that resolved that problem for us as well. They shut their capital account. We were yeah. we were happy to take the bribe as far as it was going to go. I mean, that that's all a bit of a joke, but it, but it, it, China is one possible stimulus for mm. it. Um, mm. In so far as you know, then they're, they're not the the good uh, global citizen that everyone was counting on. But, but, but um, part of it might be if if our iron ore revenue dries up and our coal revenue dries up and our, our yeah. gas revenue dries up, then all of a sudden maybe a few people actually need, do need to take us. What other industries could we actually... Right. Mm. Well, I, I think we'll, we'll go back to uh, the term funding facility at that <laughs> yeah. point. But, but that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, if, if you... The thing is, the tools are all there. Yes. Like, yeah. you can... Do, it'd be great to have a term funding facility if you also had a harsh macro prudential. Yeah. At the time, because what you're going to do is trash your currency without blowing a housing bubble, and and so then you can start to rebuild your tradable sectors yeah. and stuff. So the answers are all there, yes. but but somehow uh, wrestling with this bag of cats of interests that have just taken over yeah. is is extremely difficult to dislodge. And I think that's really really important to sort of to end with because the tools are there, the components to do things differently mm. are there, right? It actually becomes a political will question. Absolutely. Right? Not an economic skill question. Yeah. Mm. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, we, we may see a, the rise of a sensible new party somewhere. Mm. Um, you know, sadly at the moment, we're getting the rise of a loon party. Um, uh, 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 there's obviously a lot of anger in the community after COVID, quite naturally, yeah. that needs an outlet. Uh, and I mean, and that's that is a febrile environment where you could get change, but um, sadly in Australia that tends to to take us to our default populism, <laughs> um, rather than some because we're quite anti-intellectual yeah. as a nation and suspicious of ideas, uh, and so it's going to take something, you know, pretty special to sort of rise up and change it. I mean, that, I think Labor of the kind of 80s was is maybe a paradigm for it, um, but. 
but that that was very um, circumstantial and you know a bunch of extraordinary people happened to come together yeah. um, but that's the sort of thing we're going to need yeah well, guys, I really appreciate your time today, and thanks for coming and visiting me in the studio here and seeing uh, what we do. And, um, you know, some of those thematics I wouldn't mind picking up down the track because I think there are some really, really important points here in terms of thinking differently about the problem, right? Mm. Because there are solutions out there, mm. right? And uh, I'm not prepared to just uh, roll over and say it's too hard, right? Because there are things we could be doing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Hey, there, there are, there's probably like a big five ideas. Yeah that would radically change the the direction of the economy and country right. you know but they, they all face the same problem there the, those that it will cost have the ear of canberra yeah well maybe we should do a show subsequent on the big five ideas because yeah, i think that would yeah. be a really interesting conversation to have yeah. guys thanks very much thanks a lot thanks man